morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webcast entitled Making 900 Megahertz Wideband Measurements Using a PXA Performance Spectrum Analyzer and VSA Software. This is being brought to you by Agilent Technologies. My name is Eileen Meenan, and I will be your host today. Our presenter is Walt Schulte, Aerospace Defense Application Engineer with Agilent Technologies. In today's webcast, Walt will discuss how to make 900 megahertz wideband measurements with the PXA signal analyzer as a tunable down converter, along with an Infinium oscilloscope as a digitizing front end and vector signal analysis software. We will begin today's webcast in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the system. The WebEx Event Center allows you to sit back and have the navigation advance automatically. To participate in the question and answer session, you can enter questions at any time during this presentation in the chat window and direct them to all panelists. Walt will be answering questions only at the end of this webcast, but please feel free to enter them at any time during the webcast. If we are unable to answer all of the questions in the allotted time, one of the presenters will follow up after this webcast via email. Finally, we ask that you take a moment at the end to fill out the short feedback form that will appear when you close your WebEx session. This enables us to give you quality presentations. And now, I will turn the floor over to Walt. Welcome, Walt. Thanks, Eileen. Welcome to Agile and Technology Seminar on Wideband Vector Signal Analysis Measurements. My name is Walt Schulte, and I'm an Applications Engineer in the Agile and Microwave and Communications Division. Our division is primarily involved in the design and development of spectrum analyzers, sources, signal creation software such as Signal Studio, and vector signal analysis software. I am located at our facility in Santa Rosa, California, which is an hour north of the San Francisco Bay. I've worked for Agilent since August. Prior to joining Agilent, I worked for NavAir as a system and test engineer for a defensive electronic countermeasure suite. I have previously worked for Applied Signal Technology, now part of Raytheon, developing and testing radar algorithms, and have also served aboard a San Diego-based frigate in the United States Navy. I would like you to thank you for taking the time to attend the seminar and hope you find the seminar worthwhile. Let's get to our agenda. First, we're going to discuss how technological advancement and necessity have driven the need for greater bandwidth for commercial and radar, commercial and military applications. We'll next discuss a couple of wideband examples from radar and digital communication. Then we'll talk about the trade-offs between power, efficiency, complexity, and bandwidth. We'll weave substantial theory of common impairments in our, into our discussion of design considerations and explain how all of these design considerations and impairments, when taken together, translate into the need for wider modulation bandwidth and thus wider measurement bandwidth. Finally, we'll discuss our measurement solutions. Moore's law predicts that the transistor count in integrated circuits will double every two years. Actual progress in integrated circuit density has followed this prediction fairly closely since the early 70s. We see this trend manifest in the dramatic performance improvements of all things electronic, from cell phones to electronic test equipment. As performance and capabilities of these devices have increased, the demand for bandwidth has also increased exponentially. Examples include cell phones with browsing and video capabilities, digital TV, satellite communications, and radar and electronic warfare systems. This demand for bandwidth is uniform across all transmission media, including wireline, fiber optic, and RF. 
in many cases, we've become more efficient users of available bandwidth as evidenced by DSL internet connections on home phone lines and the complex modulation formats used for digital communications. But it still seems that everyone today wants more bandwidth for their application. However, as both bandwidth, as both civilian and military data consumers demand more bandwidth, they are also demanding better signal fidelity. That's where vector signal analysis comes in. For our first use case, let's consider pulse compression radar. In a linear frequency modulated, or LFM, pulse compression radar, the transmitted signal consists of RF rectangular pulses of equal amplitude. The RF signal frequency within the pulse is varied linearly from frequency F1 to frequency F2. Upon reception, the signal is downconverted and passed through a match filter, also known as a pulse compression filter, to achieve pulse compression. The compressed pulse signal is then detected and processed through an IQ detector. The peak power of the pulse is increased by the pulse compression ratio. With LFM chirp pulse compression, more bandwidth allows greater chirp width and frequency, which, in turn, allow you to transmit a wider pulse while maintaining the same level of range resolution. Wider LFM pulses allow you to transmit lower peak power while maintaining the same level of average power and pulse repetition frequency to reduce the probability of your own detection while maintaining the same unambiguous range. Another advantage of wider bandwidth is simply in the processing gain due to the pulse compression itself. For a given false alarm rate, greater pulse compression increases the probability of detection. Only a few dB of SNR separates a radar marginal detection capability from a radar with good detection capability. One thing's for sure, in the radar world, everyone is always talking about going wider in bandwidth. Bandwidth for synthetic aperture radar, for instance, or SAR imagery, are already around 5 to 600 megahertz and are going wider. For those, of you who for those of you who don't know, synthetic aperture radar is an increasingly popular radar mode that involves using radio frequency pulses integrated over a certain time interval or coherent processing interval along an aircraft flight path to produce high-resolution ground maps. Think of it as a photograph with a radar instead of an optical or infrared camera. So what's a better choice for measuring radar signals? The spectrum analyzer on the left or the vector signal analyzer, which we'll discuss in greater detail in a bit. In a bit. Well, the spectrum analyzer only displays a view of the signal's frequency and amplitude. Frequency versus time information is not available. Since the LFM chirp frequency changes linearly with time, we now need an instrument that can characterize how the signal's frequency changes with respect to time. This is a perfect application for the vector signal analyzer on the right. The classic spectrum analyzer makes scalar measurements, such as magnitude versus frequency and magnitude versus time in zero span. A vector measurement is one in which a final IF, or RF, as in the case of our infinium scopes, is low-pass filtered, sampled, and quadrature mixed to form I and Q pairs used to measure magnitude versus frequency or time, phase versus frequency or time, gain, and group delay. We can also perform modulation analysis and capture waveforms. Now, many people need a spectrum analyzer for the measurements we can do very well, such as harmonics, intermod, EMI, and the like. Others require, in addition, the speed that banded FFT-based analyzers like the VSA offer, or the ability to analyze transient signals and make recordings. 
then there are all the enormous advantages quadruple detection in the VSA offers. We're going to demonstrate today that you no longer need to choose between the two forms of measurement. You can have both on the same instrument. Here we show four measurements of an LFM radar signal, starting in the upper left and going clockwise. Note that in addition to being able to measure the pulse spectrum, we can also measure the power envelope of a single pulse, as we've done on the bottom left, and the phase terms of our LFM equation on the right. The one-half UT squared term is measured on the top right, phase versus time. And the derivative of the phase term is measured on the bottom right, frequency versus time. U is the LFM slope and is the bandwidth of the chirp divided by the pulse width. For our second example, let's discuss wideband data links. The Army, Navy, and Air Force are certainly always looking for wider bandwidths as unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, and satellite payloads grow in sensing, processing, and now even targeting capability. One recent example might be the Global Hawk UAV. One description of the Global Hawk I found says that the Global Hawk can carry out reconnaissance missions in all types of operations. The 14,000 nautical mile range and 42 hour endurance of the air vehicle, combined with the satellite and line of sight communication links to ground forces, permits worldwide operation of the system. The Air Force has the, the Global Hawk. The Navy is getting a version. NASA has a couple, and pretty much everyone wants one. Now, the admirals and generals love these UAVs because you can have some kid sitting in Nevada sitting Mountain Dew fly a combat mission on the opposite side of the world and just hand over the joystick to the person relieving him after his shift or watch is up. The Air Force is now training more UAV pilots than it is pilots for manned aircraft and the trend towards greater UAV usage in general, not just of the Global Hawk, is exploding. But there are a bunch of non-military applications for UAVs also. Law enforcement is the first and most obvious. Infrared and HD cameras can be mounted on small UAVs and flown over problem areas, almost continuously providing live feeds. This provides an enormous force multiplier for local forces with shrinking budgets. They can also be used to monitor crops, both illegal and illegal, and illegal as well as livestock herds. In the field of precision agriculture, image processing algorithms are being developed that allow the user to tell the difference between healthy and unhealthy crops from the air. The basic idea is that there are a lot of uses for UAVs. They provide enormous force for manpower multiplication, and they're much cheaper than manned aircraft, well, usually. Soon they may become as dense as in the air as passenger pigeons. HD video streams from these crafts using satellite links with many UAVs using the same satellite will require a lot of bandwidth, which translates into the need for wideband measurement capability and the ability to measure signal fidelity at the same time. To get back to our more specific UAV case, Let's consider the Global Hawk data link requirements. So SAR data accounts for 50 megabits per second alone. Adding electro-optic and infrared imagery, as well as command and control, can push data link requirements much higher. These links must fu function in hostile environments reliably. Aside from the high data requirements, the link distances themselves are quite large. Remember, the goal of this aircraft is to provide commanders with multiple different types of images in real time from anywhere in the world. The high data rate requirements of the Global Hawk translate directly into extreme bandwidth requirements. So more spectrally efficient modulations are available. Simpler modulations, such as DPSK with wider bandwidth, 
are often used instead for satellite and UAV communications. Transmitter power is limited, and higher carrier frequencies increase the likelihood that the modulator will add impairments such as phase noise. Power limitations and noise increase the likelihood that one symbol will be mistaken for another when complex modulation formats are used. Here's an illustration of what we discussed in the previous slide. If we compare BPSK to a gray-coated 16 qualm signal, some important differences become apparent. The symbol represents groups of bits. BPSK has two symbols, where 16 qualm has 16 symbols. The greater number of unique symbols, the more bits that can be sent at once, and the less bandwidth is required for a given data rate. The BPSK modulation theoretically transmits one bit per symbol, while the 16 qualm transmits four bits per symbol. But notice how much smaller the spacing is between the symbols, both in phase and amplitude, for the 16 qualm signal. As these symbols travel further and further from the transmitter, the space between them shrinks with one upon the square of the distance they've traveled. In other, in other words, they grow closer and closer to the further and further they travel towards the receiver. From 60,000 feet or from space, this is quite a distance. These are examples of impairments a modulator can add as it converts digital bits into an analog signal for a transmission. On the left is phase noise and its characteristic rotational spreading of the symbol points. In the middle, amplitude to phase conversion, often called AMPM, which occurs due to nonlinear components. And on the right, geometric constellation skew. These are all common digital modulation implementation impairments. Unfortunately, these impairments only serve to increase the carrier-to-noise requirement over the theoretical minimums. As modulations get more complicated, these errors degrade performance more significantly and must be carefully controlled. So how does one determine if they are starting with a good modulation? Will the modulation come close to theoretical carry-to-noise performance? A popular measurement to assess the accuracy of the modulated signal is error vector magnitude. Error vector magnitude is the difference between a reference vector, assumed to be theoretically perfect, and the actual received signal vector. EVM allows the engineer to compare their modulation with a known good modulation generated in the test equipment. Analog modulation imperfections can be identified and traced back to their fundamental mechanism by careful examination of EVM measurements. When EVM is reduced to fractions of a percent, the modulated signal will require carrier-to-noise ratios very close to the theoretical minimums. Because EVM provides an aggregate summary of many types of modulation impairments, it is often used to specify modulation performance in radios that are required to conform to an RF or air interface for interoperability. To measure EVM, vector signal analyzers must generate a reference vector for the desired modulation. Agilent's vector signal analyzers offer EVM measurements on a wide variety of modulation types and other variations such as filtering and symbol rates. This includes many popular modulation formats such as AM, FM, PM, QPSK, QAM, and OFDM. Of particular concern to the radio engineer is the addition of unwanted phase noise to our modulated signal during the up-conversion process. Phase noise, or unwanted random phase changes in our transmitted signal, has the effect of limiting data quality. 
The oscillators used to drive the mixers that upconvert the modulated signal are always present. Thus, their phase noise can raise the error rate regardless of signal strength. This background, or minimum possible error rate, is called residual bit error rate. And many high-quality wireless data links used for control of large electric power plants and substations, for instance. It is not uncommon for customers to demand that this bit error rate be less than one error in every trillion bit set. But how does unwanted phase noise influence the bandwidth of our signal? After all, we're trying to design for minimum bandwidth, aren't we? In general, as we create higher frequency sources to translate our signals to higher frequencies, the phase noise increases. For example, in a coherently synthesized radio, multiplication of low-frequency crystal reference can increase the phase noise by 20 times the log of the multiplication factor n. Our low EVM modulation will be degraded by the sum of all the phase noise added from the oscillators in the system. Unwanted phase noise is thus a problem for both the up converter and the down converter. The total phase noise is the geometric addition of all of the sources, or the root sum of the squares. The addition of phase noise can present a very difficult problem for the wireless system engineer. As we stated earlier, at high frequencies, the addition of unwanted phase noise from the up and down converters can become so large as to make some spectrally efficient modulations impractical. Cost for low phase noise synthesizers climbs rapidly as frequency increases. Rarely are modulations like 64 qualm, for instance, implemented above 30 gigahertz for this reason. Likewise, 512 qualm is rarely used above just a few gigahertz. The WISE radio engineer realizes that large symbol constellations at high frequencies are difficult radios to build. If compact, spectrally efficient modulations are required to maximize the number of users in the frequency band, then it is very important to tightly control the phase noise. Having discussed some of the issues and difficulties achieving theoretical carrier noise and the impairment to gaining maximum spectral efficiency. How do we measure them? This is an example of a Y-band signal using QPSK modulation, down converted through the PXA high performance signal analyzer measured on our 89600B vector signal analysis software. We used the PXA as a tuner and digitized its IF output using an Infinium 9000 series scope. The 89600B is a software vector signal analyzer that supports multiple hardware front ends. The front end can be a hardware the front end hardware can be a digitizer, like an Agilent Infinium oscilloscope, or a tuner digitizer combination, like the Agilent PXA signal analyzer and the Infinium scope mentioned above. Not only will the VSA work remotely with the instrument, but it will also work as an application on the instrument itself. The solution in the center, the combination of the Infinium scope and the PXA, was the one used to make the measurements presented here today. But we also have a modular ADC, the M9202A, that works very well as a digitizer for the wideband IF output of the PXA, and also works very well with the 89600B vector signal analyzer. The price ranges for the PXA and PXA digitizer combinations come from the various PXA frequency ranges available. Our PXAs go up to 50 gigahertz. The main point of this graph is to demonstrate the trade-off between dynamic range, bandwidth, and cost, and the various solutions that we offer 
at different levels of each. But again, the 89600B vector signal analyzer works with all the instruments on this slide and many others. You simply decide your requirements and purchase accordingly. For instance, if you primarily need a spectrum analyzer but also have modest analysis bandwidth requirements that require high dynamic range, the, a PXA chosen for the high fre highest frequency measured and option D1X are the best. On the other end of the spectrum, we offer 90,000 X series oscilloscopes that directly sample frequencies up to 33 gigahertz for ultra-wideband measurements, demodulation, and signal capture. The PXA and the 2.5 gigahertz 9,000 series oscilloscope is our mid-range option for those looking for a high-performance signal analyzer and the ability to make wideband measurements of up to nine, uh, of 900 megahertz to a gigahertz. In order to whet your interest in the PXA's built-in analysis bandwidth, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the automated internal calibrations of the PXA digitizer that utilize a comb line or multitone to increase phase linearity and amplitude flatness when connected to the vector signal analyzer. Later, we'll move on to corrections for our wideband IF measurement system. The internal calibration is in two steps. First, the response of the system to the stimulus is characterized and second, corrections are applied to minimize the linear errors in both phase and amplitude. Our goal is to measure the EVM of the device under test, not the EVM of the measuring system. Many, but not all, system problems can be corrected for. Nonlinear or discontinuous error will remain. The PXA has three high-resolution analysis bandwidth options. Option B25 for 25 megahertz, option B40 with 40 megahertz, and option B1X with 140 megahertz. These all utilize a two-level level calibration. The IF calibration is injected in the front end of the mechanical attenuator and the RF calibration injected in the same place, which is a comb line injected for uh, multi-tone, used to generate ampl amplitude and phase corrections. The results of both are combined and applied as a correction filter in the analysis bandwidth purchased as options for the PXA. As an aside, I thought I'd add that 160 megahertz will be available for option D1X coming in February. So these are the results of the calibration when it's applied. We're showing low band here, but the microwave paths are actually better behaved. The results of the calibration are the same, however. As you can see, IF calibration is the most significant correction factor. One of the great features of using the built-in analysis bandwidth of the PXA is the ability to switch easily between time domain and frequency domain on the same instrument with complete control over each. Here, I've zoomed in on a signal 10 microsecond Barker coded pulse in the time domain to verify that I'm getting the radar sequence I programmed into my arbitrary waveform generator. For those of you who don't know, a Barker code is just another form of radar pulse compression used for the same reasons as linear frequency modulation. I can zoom out in the time domain and focus on spectral characteristics just as easily. Here I'm using a resolution bandwidth of 28 hertz in this 3 megahertz band. As useful as this is, if you're watching this webinar, you probably have wideband analysis requirements or expect to have them in the future. So let's move on to the topic of 900 megahertz of IF bandwidth available to us through the PXA. 
This is a simplified block diagram of the path we're discussing here with the necessary hardware options, which are microwave preselector bypass, option MPB, and the Y-band IF output, option CR3. Instead of using a high-resolution analysis bandwidth of the PXA itself, we're using a high-performance Infinium scope to digitize our Y-band IF output. The resolution is less, 8 bits for 40 dB of dynamic range, but the bandwidth is much wider. A 2.5 gigahertz 9000 series Infinium scope is plenty for this application. Before discussing how to correct our wideband IF measurement system, let's discuss setup. So this is a conceptual diagram of how you might make these measurements yourself for you to integrate and program your own measurement hardware and software. In general, if you wanted to make wide man measurements, you might use a block down converter, provided you can find one with wide enough bandwidth, with a sampling oscilloscope to record time domain data. Then you might post-process that data in MATLAB using Hilbert transform and various digital demodulation and measurement algorithms to understand the performance of your transmitter and any of its impairments. Though not a real-time solution, this is a perfectly good way of doing things, and MATLAB offers signal processing communications and instrument control, control toolboxes to allow you to do this very thing. We actually sell MATLAB as an option for most of our instruments for such purposes. You could adopt a similar solution for your electronic warfare and radar measurements, though you'd have to do a bit more of your own DSP. I've done this quite a bit, and I'm personally fond of it. However, as we're going to demonstrate, we have our own software that automates this process and allows you to add custom demodulations and corrections, as well as allows you to record and playback data. So let's get to a setup. As usual, we're going to connect to the PXA through the front end input. We're going to connect our rear wideband IF output, marked aux IF out, to our Infinium scope. And this is the rest of the information you need to set up your PXA. The basic idea is to adjust the spectrum analyzer to the appropriate RF center frequency, create an IF center frequency or appropriate IF center frequency by offsetting the 322.5 megahertz IF, bypass the microwave preselector to allow for wider IF bandwidth, and set the analyzer in zero span to prevent it from sweeping. We then program our output for wideband I the wideband IF path mentioned the slide back. Be sure to readjust your RF center frequency after creating the frequency offset, since the offset will shift your center frequency over a bit. After turning off your alignment, push single sweep to make sure all configuration changes update. If you like, you can print this slide out and take it right over to your PXA and to answer a question from the audience, yes, you will be able to receive this presentation afterward. So let's briefly discuss offsets. In our case, the normal IF is always 322.5 megahertz. Agilent recommends a desired IF of no greater than 700 megahertz for maximum IF bandwidth of 1 gigahertz. If the required IF bandwidth is 500 megahertz or less, we recommend using the standard 322.5 megahertz IF with no frequency offset. In our example, we're using an offset of minus 377.5 megahertz for an IF center frequency of 700 megahertz and an IF bandwidth of 900 megahertz. Once you've connected your source, use later for our corrections, to the RF input of the PXA, 
and the IF output to the scope. Connect your vector signal analyzer to the scope if it's running on a separate computer or simply use it on the scope directly. Next, configure the vector signal analyzer for use with the down converter. Now we're ready to correct out frequency response impairments and amplitude losses caused by the wideband IF path through the PSA. For a 10 gigahertz carrier with 900 megahertz of IF bandwidth, you would program your sweep to go from 9.55 gigahertz to 10.45 gigahertz in about 20 seconds. If the ADC is over, being overdriven, that is the ADC on your scope, adjust the range value in the upper left corner of the VSA, and that's right here. Agile and sources such as the PSG and MXG have great amplitude flatness over wide sweeps. But if greater amplitude flatness is desired, an external leveling loop can be used to improve amplitude ripple. You can consult the application node entitled Making Wideband Measurements, and we'll provide the document number and link afterward. For more information on using an external leveling loop, or you can consult the manual of your source itself. Next, copy the trace in the last slide, this trace, to register D1. Apply register D1 as a correction in the fixed equalization tab under the input menu. And finally, this is the result of the corrections when applied. Be sure to restart the VSA by pressing play in the upper left-hand corner. Be sure also to remove the continuous peak hold averaging. Notice now that the scale is 1.5 dB per division, so we have a minimum amplitude ripple even without using an external leveling loop to do corrections. And on to our amplitude corrections. Simply take the difference in the CW power coming from the source in that read by the V vector signal analyzer. Apply a fixed correction. In this case, we saw 10 dB of loss across our cabling and IF path into the scope, so we added 10 dB to our VSA. So here are the results. This is a single pulse of an 850 megahertz wide LFM chirp showing the unwrapped phase versus time on the top right and frequency versus time on the bottom right. The screen capture below is a below the chirp is 150 megahertz or 100 I'm sorry 150 millisecond recording I made of a single PRI radar pulse train. This wideband measurement solution saved me several programming steps programming and configuration steps over any alternatives. The vector signal analyzer automatically connects to my measurement hardware, in this case my Infinium sampling scope. It allows me to add my own corrections. It demodulated my signals. It works with my down converter, in this case my TXA signal analyzer. And it allows me to capture pulse trains for playback and analysis. It also has an application programming information, application programming interface for automating measurements. If you want more information, please use the links provided on the slide where I've also listed the application note pertaining to this webinar. And that is this one down here. We at Agilent thank you for listening to this webinar and hope you found it worth your time.